You're listening to The Dental Guys, Episode 75, the Academy of Osseo Integration Meeting 2018 Recap. So for this episode, Wes and I got to spend an entire day watching the AO meeting in the theater room here at our studio, and we took away some really interesting things from this meeting, starting with a great discussion on socket shield partial extraction technique. Is it experimental and crazy, or is it the new clinical standard? And w really, do we care about insertional torque value anymore or is it all about resonant frequency analysis or is there something that brings these two together and john yeah finally we had over 200 year combined years of implant experience on the podium for the probably the most epic <laughs> expert <laughs> discussion panel and they fought it out to the death so we're excited about this episode join us now ao recap starts right now with the dental guys this episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by The Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, The Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes, the dental guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. Well, hey, and welcome to the Dental Guys podcast. This is a little different because we're coming to you live from the same studio. And, you know, right back behind us here is you got a little glimpse of it. If you saw earlier today, the theater room. Hey, now yeah. you know what's behind the yeah. scenes. <laughs> behind here, if you see those little black things up there, those are some speakers. And, uh, you know, most people use their theater room for watching, you know, like X-Men or, you know, Infinity we do, War. We do that, And too. we do that, too. But... We today the theater room was used for some very different things. It was used for the dental geek session of the year. We had like a marathon today. Oh my goodness! I think um, I rolled in here at like nine thirty, nine forty. Had a little breakfast, a little bite to eat, courtesy of John's wife, and uh, mm. it was amazing. Mm. It was so amazing, good. and so and then immediately we just jumped right in it. Uh, this year, um, we didn't get to go to Los Angeles and cover. The Academy of Osseo Integration yeah. meeting. First time in a long time. First we time in a long meeting. time we've missed the meeting, and we felt like, hey, why not do it justice? And if you don't know this, if you aren't able to ever make it to the meeting, you can purchase the entire meeting so that you can watch it and receive CE credit. Um, and actually, it's qu quite a value. Yeah, uh, because we're talking about you know, and just so you know, AO is not paying us to say this or whatever, but. You can go, you can buy the entire meeting for 225 bucks. Mm. Uh, and it's, I mean, we're talking, it's quality, and you get to actually download the videos. It's not just a streaming right. deal. So you have access to these, you know, pretty much permanently. And you could watch them over and over. Over and over. So I, I, I knew that this would be a good day, but you know what I want to do while we're with you guys for a few minutes on Facebook Live is right. I, I want to dive right into what we learned today because there's there's a few things we want to cover, and we're not going to do the entire show live. But, no, but no. we really one of the things that that was interesting because you know the AO is a as most if you know anything about the Academy of Austin Integration, it's kind of a conservative organization in, in a good way, and they kind of go back and forth each year between kind of pushing forward, I feel like, and then sort of pulling back to what do we really know. This year was more about what do we know right. but they were evaluating some of the newer kind of tips and techniques and one of those that we've been hearing a lot about is socket shield now people are challenging us to look at this technique i know many of you have sent us messages and saying what do you think about socket shield you know, partial extraction technique yeah pet, pet. yeah you know yeah. and there's these courses now that you can actually go take where they'll teach you how to do this pet technique and essentially they'll describe the technique like this you essentially use an ultrasonic or a diamond burr and you extract 95% of the tooth, leaving a very small portion of the tooth at the coronal portion next to the buccal plate. Now, the interesting thing here is, is that 
we've been taught in school to remove all the tooth. Don't leave any part of the tooth because there can be an altered healing. And one of our, actually one of the lectures we were listening to, we'll get to this, talked about maybe some complications concerning that. But this has been something that keeps coming up. Yeah. And I feel like that the Academy this year spent quite a bit of time yeah. discussing pet technique. John, yeah. tell us a little bit about some of the initial thoughts that yeah. we kind of gathered from this. Well, I, I was interested by, you know, looking at the um, the pre-meeting schedule. You know, we saw that there were actually mm. two two lectures that were specifically about partial extraction technique, not on the main podium, but kind of in the, the surgical track, which is they break right. it out into surgical and prosthetic. And, and one of them was called, you know, uh, experimental or clinical reality, you know, mm. and that was a great question. And, and then there was a, a another couple of, uh, the, the actual originators really of this technique, Marcus Herzler and Otto Zur from Germany. Wait, were, were the guys that invented yeah. or came up with the protocol right. to do 2009, this. 2010, they, they started doing this. So right. they, they uh, really have, um, I mean, and there's other great clinicians that have been involved with this, like Salama and Garber and a lot of other people, but th they were the originators. So they spoke about this technique. I mean, so, so you really can't get it from, I think, any higher authority. Right. And so, so kind of what they talked about, they showed some cases and of course they were, there wasn't the whole, their whole lecture wasn't on this one thing. They were talking about ways that we can improve our predictability. Right, so extract a tooth and prevent, basically, the right. buccal plate from collapsing, yeah, they went, especially in aesthetic cases. Right, they went through this whole idea that, you know, Jan Lindy and, uh, and his group back years and years ago, Rougeau, proved that the bundle bone, which is the bone that's attached to the periodontal ligament, mm. um, will resorb kind of no matter what you yeah, do. Yeah, it's kind of unpredictable, right? Right, so they mm -hmm. talked a lot about the buccal contour collapsing and that that was a big problem. So how could we prevent that? Well, mm. one idea with that, as we've talked about before, is dual zone socket technique of trying to build up the soft tissue zone with graft. But their idea is, well, maybe could we use socket shield or partial extraction technique? And, you know, I think we'll boil this down, their talk, to just saying... They have done this. They've got probably about five years now of yeah, actual follow-up. Yeah, the longest case was like since 2000. Yeah. They've, they've done a couple cases that were, like that, that? yeah, they've done a couple cases that are eight or nine years old, but I think they have, you know, a case series. I think it was like 15 cases, 16 right. cases that's been followed out five years and with, and with pretty good results. So to give them a lot of credit, there are some cases that they've shown, but they were very, very, very careful to say. Wait a minute now. They were very careful. They were they so made a big deal. So careful that they made a really big deal about some, and they used some words, and I wrote them down. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the three three words that stood out for me, we warn you. Yeah, we warn you. Right now, why would they warn us about a technique that they believe in? Right, because John, it's not completely figured out. In fact, they said this: let the experienced people figure this out right. and systematize yeah. it. Let us experienced guys figure this out right. and wait. Yeah, and they and said wait. too, you know, he said, we want to be very careful to say we do not do this on a daily basis. You oh know, my. he said this is not a daily thing that we do. It's it's something that we do in the in the perfect case. Mm. It's very technique sensitive. And, you know, they really went on about that for like at least three or four minutes at the end. And they only had, had about a 20 minute talk. And the last three or four minutes was basically caution about mm -hmm. this is an interesting technique. It, and, and I think, as we've talked about before, what's driving a lot of the interest in this is it's cool and it's yeah. different and yeah. it's sexy. And they were here's the originators of it who are pretty progressive people saying, guys, just hold on to the thought here of this, and, and let's come back after we have some controlled clinical trials. Yeah, we need controlled clinical trials. We need to, to study this. We need to figure out what's going to happen. I think it was interesting kind of to come full, uh, actually, to the end of the conference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was so intrigued, um, Dr. Norton. Yeah, because let me just say, the end of the conference, Wes is going to talk about, because we're going to spend the last probably 20 minutes of our show on this, 
they had probably the best panel discussion I've ever seen. It was amazing. They had, you know, all of some, they had combined 200 years of clinical experience talking about all these issues. They had Michael Norton as the moderator. Uh, they had Dennis Tarnow up there, Ole Jensen up there, David Cochran up there. Mm, mm. Uh, and, and they also had Thomas <laughs> Albrechtson, you know, one of P.I. Brand Marks. You know, I mean, he's the man. He's the man. And, and, and they asked them the question, right, Wes? They said, Michael Norton said, I want each of you mm. to weigh in on the socket shield, the partial extraction technique. So, Wes, just let's talk a little bit about yeah, what so, each of those people so said. So, Dennis Tarnow, you know, he's the, him and Steve Chu, you know, they're all about the dual zone technique. So there is some bias there because they have their own published technique of grafting the second zone. So, you know, hey, what's up to some of our friends that are right, watching this? Some of our out. closest friends giving us a shout out right there. So appreciate you guys for tuning in. But, you know, Dennis Tarnow is a dual zone guy right? for grafting and doing immediate extraction, immediate placement. And his biggest concern was one, that it hasn't been systematized, and what happens if this periodontal ligament that's still that you're in the socket, you're there. leaving in the socket, basically the first time he saw a resident leave this, he said, I about flipped out because mm -hmm. the periodontal ligament has cells right. that would alter the wound healing because what happens when you leave a toothpiece in there is that the PDL tries to, re to reform cementum. cementum. So now you're going to encapsulate a periodontal ligament in cementum, and then that's going to be up against graft material that's going and to... And against implant. implant. So and now you're adding another cellular right. substance. And he actually said we could see periodontal disease going down the front of the implant because there's a periodontal ligament now potentially... Now, he called out some people. Yeah. He called out some people. Yeah, that was mean, the other thing that happened He from that. said that he's seen some people that are teaching courses that are not very good clinicians. Yeah. Who are just trying to make money. He's like, now don't get me wrong, there's good people. They, they, yeah, but he there's also Salama and right? Garber and But he and, said there's also some people money grabbing right they're now. They're money grabbing because and, they know people want a solution. So I think we have to be very careful. Yeah, and so, so what, the, what did Ole Jensen say? Well, so Jensen, you know, who probably is the most experienced surgeon on the stage. Well, you know, tell us who he is. Yeah. Please. So for those of you who don't know, you know, he he edits Jomi's uh, you know, basically their their bone research and their biologic research division of that journal. So knows a lot, but Really, his 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 uh, experience comes from Clear Choice. He is the primary surgeon at probably the biggest Clear Choice center ever, and has put in literally. I think he's put in over like fifteen thousand implants or something wow. like that. Uh, and and so he just has a tremendous amount of surgery. He's an oral surgeon, tremendous amount of surgical knowledge. And you know, his his thought was, he goes, you know. If the tooth is ankylosed completely, he's like, the body kind of right. treats that, maybe that ankylosed tooth as bone. And so maybe in those cases it, it could work. But he said, you know, if you're leaving um, a, a periodontal ligament that's actually viable, he said, you know, what happens if, if this piece does mm. get loose? And what if it breaks off? Right, comes out. How do out. you treat that? Right, because, you know, if you're building that into your case, and mm. they were especially talking about younger patients, they said a lot of these they're seeing done in younger patients, so these basically, cases. like a twenty-five or thirty-five-year-old right. that could live to be eighty-five. Right. And so, what happens what's if happens? it fails? Let's just say you lose that bone, or that you lose that tooth mm. piece, and and now you have bone. Now, you know, as we all know, implants are in there, quote unquote, forever. But now, if you lose that facial tissue. Mm -hmm. um, in a young patient, now you have a significant reconstruction versus going ahead and doing conventional techniques that right. we know work. And then at least, yes, maybe maybe they're not as good as socket shield even, but at least we know that they're hopefully going to stay and we don't have as many questions about the long term with that. So I went and John went and myself, we went and asked Dr. Greg Kinzer at Spear Education this very question, what has he seen concerning mm -hmm. socket shield? Mm -hmm. And he had a very similar answer to this panel is that we need to be very cautious mm -hmm. because there's not a... An, a, really a protocol. No. And that to come back to the beginning of this, and, and the people that have invented this technique, they say we warn you. All right. We need to create more evidence, they say. Yep. And and I think that this is a technique that needs to be, you know, John, we talked about like leaving stuff in the hands of the experimenters. Right, and like the researchers. The researchers, yeah. the people that are really have the time 
to do it right. They have, I mean, like the ultrasonic alone that right. really does the proper job on this is ten thousand dollars. Right, the piezo you're talking right, about. Right, the piezo. Yeah, so, and, and that's the other thing is just the instrumentation for this to do it right. You know, there's skill, very specific skill. ways you have to do it. Very specific instrumentation. Yeah, what if a tube abscess? Do you do it? What if right. the tube? And I know that some of the protocols are, that are being taught are probably systemized and all that, and it looks like it's safe. This is not something I'm incorporating in my practice, John. Right, right, and maybe it turns out it's that that you know after after five years, ten more, whatever it is, enough hey. cases go by. Uh, but I think there are some definite problems, potential problems, and each one of the presenters on this panel said, "Nope, wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't mm -hmm. do it." And these were researchers. Some of them, some of them were clinicians, but all of them. Extremely How many years of experience on this? Panel? Yeah, they said 200 <laughs> combined years of experience. So I think what we got from that is, you know, it's interesting, and, and we're certainly going to be following the the literature on this. Right. Uh, and and you know, but we we also want to understand that there's caution where you should have caution. So, you know, that that was a very interesting thing because it was a question we didn't know how where they would go. So where this. do the dental guys right now stand on socket shield or this uh, partial extraction therapy technique, the PET technique, as you hear? We feel like that it really resides in the hands of the people that are researching this. Yep. Um, I think that it's they're... It's experimental. It's experimental. It's very early data shows that it is something we need to kind of look at. Right. But you guys know that when we started this podcast, we said, you know, whenever you see something at five years, you kind of lift your head and you look up at that and you say, you know what, I need to read more about that, but I'm not going to change yet. And then when we said, we said, oh, what if you see something at 10 years? That's a practice changer. Right. Now, right? now you kind of feel like you can put your faith in that. Mm. And there also has to be the, you know, enough number uh, we talked about oh, on one man. of our last shows, you know, well, we're one of the speakers and one of those, you know, uh, uh, that we talked about today, but we talked about this on our last implant show, you know, Marco de Gitti <laughs> for that. He's like, I did a study, you know, yeah, 4,100 4, implants followed over 10 years. It was like, like when we saw, you know, Fugazato's short implant study, you know, and he mm. shows thousands of implants followed over 10 years. That's the stuff we pay attention to. So while early signs of, of pet are very promising, uh, you know, we want you guys to also keep in mind that this is something that it's not to the point where it should change your practice, but it should be something you should be paying attention to. So with that, yeah. we're going to say goodbye to our Facebook Live. You're going to, for the rest of this, you're going to have to tune into the show when it comes out. When this episode airs, it's going to be a few weeks from now. Yeah, another 40, uh, 30, 40 minutes of us talking oh, about the, what we just watched. We got a lot hours. more good <laughs> stuff to share with you guys, including this panel discussion, which was oh. very tense. <laughs> and you could tell the people like up whenever there. Whenever everybody's looking down, yeah. and they're like, I don't want to look at this guy. Right. And people are like, it's okay. Dis I'm still your friend. Yeah, disagreement. You know, <laughs> is, you know they encourage disagreements. So good. But so it's good. been fun, Wes. It's yeah. been fun doing the Facebook Live. And make sure you connect with us on Facebook. Ask it's good to be here in the studio with you, man. Well, and, yeah. and I'm, glad, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> we, we rarely get to do this. So, all right. All right well, guys, thanks for listening. And we'll uh, be talking back with you soon. All right. All right. If you're continuing listening to this, John, the next thing that we really kind of, we've kind of talked about it already, is does insertional torque value, meaning like when I put my implant in mm -hmm. and it goes in mechanically, rotationally, it just feels tight. Right. Like how tight is too tight? Yeah. And is it meaningless? Is insertional torque value meaningless? Is there a better way to evaluate it? And so this next thing that we kind of, I feel like that the AO kind of put it to rest for a little while. For sure. Um, and I also feel like that they said that there may be th some things that are on the horizon that could be a better way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the, the answer, but I feel like that right now we have some answers. Let's talk about insertional torque value, how to assess implant readiness, meaning readiness to immediately load. Because yeah. uh, we have a lot of placers that listen to this podcast. Sure, or restorative and, docs and that want to know doctors, when can they put a crown on. Well, you know, if your surgeon sends you an implant, John, right. and you feel like, hey, is this implant ready? And it says, hey, I torque tested the implant at, on this date, and I feel like that it's ready. Is that a viable way to test the biological stability of that implant? Or is it just that we continually, do we need something else in, to test it? Yeah. So let's talk about that. Yeah, it was such a great session because this session was one where we had 
uh, three experts mm. all weighing in with different approaches to this problem. And you know, the first one to talk was Alan Meltzer, who's a you know great lecturer came in very strong and said, you know, hey, I like high torque. And the reason I like high torque is as he's citing studies showing that in in some of the, in the studies he's showing that a higher torque was associated with success. I like him, yeah. period. Like, I really like his approach to this. Mm -hmm. I felt like that it was, yes, he came right up front and said, I really like to have you know, a really high insertional torque value. I'm right. just that guy. So I want to tell you that up front. Yes, but, he was very upfront about that. But I feel like that, like, he's the kind of guy you could sit down and he's going to be like, you know, what do you think about this? Right. And what's your clinical evidence that shows that you should be doing it this way? Yep. You know? and, and to kind of go, so he, he spoke about why he liked high torque. And his big thing, I think, was, you know, he was a big immediate uh, load uh, fan mm -hmm. and, you know, immediate placement fan. Um, and he wants to feel confident about, right. you know, that, that this implant has uh, stability. But the thing that I liked about what he said, which really went right into the next lecture, was he said, you know, you have to be aware of your implant geometry. And if you're putting this implant in and it's and the torque is low, 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 and then the last like millimeter, all of a sudden it peaks out to 70. And ha that happens, why? Uh, right, that happens because often you have a geometry where the implant either has a flare at the coronal or, or has a different thread type at the coronal, uh, you know, or may have a platform that's wider at the coronal in general. And so, and two, you've got what kind of bone up there? Very cortical bone. Cortical dense bone at the coronal yeah. portion. So, right. so you may get, you know, so what do you take from that? You know, he says, well, your instinct wants to tell, oh, it's 70. Right. Well, but you were down at 10 the whole time. And he said that. So I don't didn't even... he define like insertional torque value is the value while you're inserting right. it? Right. He said it, he talked about, you know, the, the, the torque versus the, the final seating torque. Let me ask you this, because he said that, should we report insertional torque value and seating torque value on our clinical notes now? It, it's interesting to think about that because uh, it really is probably closer to reality. What do you think you're going to do now? I mean, I think I'm going to start noting that is when does it first kind of lock and start? When, when right. do I get my first point where, where I, I hit, say, 20? Right. You know, and then... What's the final torque reading out? Right. Because that that that's something that we 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 don't really think about as much. Right. But I think that was what was really cool about that is he says all that, and of course he made a strong case for uh, for high torque. Mm. But then at the end, the next lecturer comes up and 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 is completely on the other side of it, talking about resonance frequency analysis. Right. And but it was interesting because Marco De Gitti, who was the last lecturer, he talked about trying to put those two things together. And he said that almost the same thing as somebody, I think he completely disagrees with high torque, but he sees, he, he talked about, okay, these same kind of cases when he showed the WNH graph where these the fancy WNH will show you the graph of your torque and you can actually go back and, and see that. And so this little graph is showing like low, 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 all of a sudden spikes high. Yeah, so it's real time reporting right. of as the drill is putting the implant in, it's right. reporting the torque. So so he showed that graph where it was low, 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 and then a spike. And then he showed a graph where it was a constant linear curve up with mm. just little variations constantly. And he said he said what we've found, and he's done, you know, he had the study with 4,000 implants. Only 4,000. Only 4,000. It was just a couple. And he goes, you know, what I've found is that the ones that are that are more predictable are the ones with this more constant upward curve. So his thought is to try to put that into mathematical terms. And he is measuring the area under the graph yeah. or under the curve, which is the integral for the, mm -hmm. your calculus nerds out there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so he's finding the integral. Now, now, don't get me wrong. He's not calculating this integral, but he's trying to develop software. Right. He's trying will, to do like really an algorithm. Yeah. Now, what he did say on that is right now he's putting in arbitrary values for what he feels like he feels like is the right value. Right. He Just based on his success. Based on his success. Yeah. And so... 
you know, he feels like that his maximum insertional torque value, which he set years ago, right? What was it? Twenty five newton centimeter. Twenty five was what he said was the minimum. minimum that was minimum, minimum. Before, before he would he load. Would load. Yeah, before yeah. he would load, he would yeah. say it had to reach twenty five. And he kind of said really it was arbitrary. It. it was arbitrary. And and so so he's kind of right in the middle because. But it was cool because but how many Mel- implants did he have fail at twenty five? Right, like none. Like you none. know. And so I think his, but it was kind of cool because here's Meltzer saying that he has this conclusion that he doesn't want it to just be the the last millimeter where it torques out high. He wants a consistent torque. And then to get, he's kind of saying, you know, there's actually something to that. Mm -hmm. And he's now trying to measure that. But right in the middle of the two, the other guy that spoke talked about, can excessive torque cause a problem? For microfracturing a bone, he showed it. Pressure necrosis, right? We know it causes microfracture, and his whole thought was really. And I thought the thing that I took from his the most, he said, you know, we're in the business of secondary stability. He said we shouldn't be so concerned about primary stability. Well, because wood, you know, this is not wood. Right? Wood is. Hey, it's dead. Right. right? Once it's in, it's in. Once it's in, it's in. Yeah. And, and but he said, you know, a high torque actually delays. Mm. secondary stability we don't know how much he said right we We don't don't know know how much much it shifts the integration curve curve. yeah like that you know we talk about that normal dip you get right three weeks 21 days per se he said that if you exceed a certain torque value and he kind of set that out we'll talk about that here in a minute but he said it may shift the curve where it takes longer, longer basically for the heal. bone to heal. Now, then he also said, he said, now we're trying to decrease that dip right. with, with these better, biologic better surface, surface technology. Is. And we've talked about spring and xylitol and your implants. Go back right. and look at that one. Right. But I mean, like, think about it. If you had something to put, if you put something special sauce on your implant, and that's what they're trying to do. Right. You know, they're trying to shift the curve to actually be less dip. Right. But he's saying that if I have a high insertional torque value, that I could actually delay bone healing right. further, and we're trying to get patients in the teeth sooner. Right. So his his solution is to rely much more on RFA and resonance frequency right. analysis because he's putting them in purposefully low torque. So if you're purposefully mm. trying to go low torque, I think that's where your RFA starts to become really important because if you're trying to make loading decisions right. in a low torque so situation. So we're talking 10 to 20 newton centimeters. Right. If you're and 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 I don't think either Wes and I are are necessarily advocating that you try mm. to load with low torque because we feel like while that certainly has been proven to be successful, right. Right. it's definitely a little bit more risky. Right. But um but I think that his point is well taken that if you're going low torque, you need to have RFA. And I think though that that even Meltzer who was very strong for high torque at the end, as they're talking, he said, you know, we really don't disagree too much on this. He said, yeah, I'm, that's why I like him. He's he said, humble. I'm comfortable more than you guys are with high torque mm. because he's, that's, that's for him something that he, but he also said he understands too that the value of RFA, the right. value of having that measurement and especially the fact that you can follow RFA over time. And right. I think that's the key we keep trying to preach here is, yeah, you know, you can only measure torque once. You measure it at surgery, and then the patient comes back, and let's just say that it's already second stage, mm-hmm. and here we are at 12 weeks. Right. And you're the surgeon or you're the restoring doc, and you want to make sure that when you take that healing abutment off, that this implant is integrated. So right. the first thing you do is you check for symptoms, right? Right, right. And we actually we tap on the healing abutment. If it sounds solid, patient's not been having any pain. These are all clinical decisions yep. you're making. And radiograph. Radiograph. You yep. look for any cupping or right. any bone loss that might not be normal. And it shouldn't be any bone loss. Actually, we should start seeing some bone growth. Mm-hmm. We should start seeing maturation of the bone graft into the own patient. So at three months, we're saying, okay, let's take the healing abutment off. Now, the question is, John, as the restoring doc, do you take the implant driver and engage the implant hex again or the de- you know the p- part that you delivered the implant with surgically mm-hmm. and take a torque wrench and turn it over at a certain insertional torque value and see if the implant spins? Mm-hmm. Or is it better to RFA your implant at three months? And I, don't, and I think that I would say none of them 
were a fan of torque testing. None of them. Because they all agreed that that's not a valid... Now, don't get me wrong. If you were to do that and the patient feels pain... We got a problem. You got a non-integrated implant. Right. Okay? We got a problem. So that's the only, to me, valid reason why torque testing is useful because it's an immediate... Fee. If the patient hurts, you got a problem. So then the question comes from the audience, John. At the end, the moderator gets up there and reads a question. So I've been a you know an implant surgeon for 15, 20 years... And I've been torque testing all of my implants and recording ITV. I'm a believer in insertional torque value being high. And I take radiographs. I check all the symptoms. Do I need to purchase a new toy, per se, right. or a new tool, right. resonant frequency analysis, some tool to measure this and trust in that as well? Right, right. And, so, and it was a great discussion because I think – you know, if and, and they were very diplomatic about it. They said, "Hey, look, if what you're doing is working, then right." We're, we're, well, they started talking about art and science. Yeah, they said, "Yeah, they said that you know you're an artist, obviously, right. that believes that you, you know you have a feel for things." Well, and part then, of what we do as surgeon is art. You're I mean, right. You can right. feel it. I mean, like you know how it is, man. I mean, you get into surgery. You've been placing right. implants for a couple years. But to now. Giddy, but to Giddy though said, he's like, "We did a study several years ago where we tried to have surgeons." feel what torque was and mm. they would give a subjective feedback well that was about 25 or and, that was about were 45, they right and they were always always wrong. <laughs> wrong and and so that doesn't mean that that art is is invalid right but i think the thing that i and you I and i have experience is changed. valid yeah absolutely but i think yeah. you and i have both changed on this once we understood the value of rfa that it's not about blindly trusting either one of these things right. you don't blindly trust torque you don't blindly trust rfa but i think it's the ability to track things and like one of them said if i start off with a resonance frequency analysis of 80 and then when i come back to load it it's 30 we got a problem. i had a problem and you know what you might not catch that with your torque test that's right what if you torque test normal but it wasn't enough torque to get that implant symptomatic. You could restore it and end up in a problem, whereas RFA might have caught that because you have something you can track over and time. And at surgery too, it just it's it sometimes it doesn't make it it boggles my mind because it, we have this little game during surgery that we'll do it in place an implant and and look at the seating torque and the seating torque. Let's say the other day was actually less than 20 on this. Now, I couldn't turn the implant. It was in a healed ridge. Mm -hmm. I actually physically tried to turn it and turn it into a spinner, and I put uh, my peg on and did a resonant frequency analysis of it, and it came back at 68. Interesting. And and you think, well, that kind of goes along with what Mike Norton said in his study right. last year in 2017. Right. He released the study yeah. and said... It's not a correlation. It's not a correlation. Yeah, it doesn't mean because you have low torque that you have a problem with bone-to-implant contact. It's not about that. You know, it's about, it's more about is that implant contacting bone? Axial stiffness is a much better mm -hmm. measure of bone to implant contact. So, so it was a great, great discussion. Segment. So yeah. the dental guys, I think, really, I, actually, I felt like really good after listening to this yeah. that one, we need to, if you can, uh, look into resonant frequency analysis. I think it's a valid way to add something to ITV mm -hmm. that really is missing, which yeah. is the biology. And and really what the panel said is like, we need to use both. Yes. We need to use both. We need to use both when evaluating, you know, at surgery and at healing times. Absolutely. I think you using it too. Um, let's just talk about the failing ailing implant. Yeah. You know, we talked about that. Speak to that for just a minute. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think if you, uh, and it's, this is still, I think, experimental, uh, to be fair, but you know, if you have an implant that comes into your practice mm. from say another office you're not familiar with or hasn't been, you know, was placed somewhere, who knows? And or, how much are the pegs, you know, that we're using? Right. They're nothing. They're no. a dollar a use basically. Right. right. So, so it's an easy way to confirm whether or not an implant is going south maybe. Right. Uh, or an implant from an unknown surgeon or That's unknown right. office. Uh, whether you really are, are comfortable <clears throat> with restoring an implant that you don't know anything about. Mm. And I think, to me, somebody on your team's got to have this, yeah. whether it's a surgeon, restorative doc, somebody. And it's hard to get the surgeons on board, though. Don't you feel like? Like, I feel like that they're so mechanically inclined. Yeah, they think that they know. I think they think that they know, and I think that they're 
they're just it's hard to change that especially when it involves a financial investment that could be a bigger financial investment and i think maybe that's part well, of the and, elephant in the and room. honestly you know who really knows out there how many people know about rfa yeah Every, i think it's growing but it's still it's, something it's, that not everybody knows right about. and how long has it been around since a long 96 time. long or time yeah it's so crazy. let's so let's get into the final segment of tonight because oh man we see i i have to i have to intro this a little bit by one of the things that ao did this year during the conference, while the conference is going on back in March, mm. they live streamed this segment uh, of the conference, and I saw it on the schedule, and I was so upset I couldn't be out there, but I, I was sitting in the car, my wife was shopping, and up at some outlet stores, and you know, I mean, so exciting. And so for me, <laughs> I was like, she's fine with me just hanging in the car. And this. I couldn't tune in. Yeah, there was some you, were, you were doing something. Yeah. So I, I paid whatever it was, 50 bucks, so that I could tune into the live stream of this panel discussion. And we introed this a little bit at the beginning mm. segment. But, you know, Michael Norton's one of our, our favorite guys to listen to because he's eloquent. He also is funny. Yeah, he's and he, awesome. But he knows how to drive the discussion and not be... You know, not just to, to be polite, but to ask the right questions. And so right. he so he assembles this panel. Mm. As we said, you know, we had all these top notch people, and they start to talk about some topics that are controversial. We've already covered Socket Shield, but let's talk about some of the other things that were discussed. And I, I just want to dive right into the one that for me was the most interesting. Because we are so interested in the single anterior immediate loaded I know where you're going with tooth, this. right? You're so passionate about this. Well, it's... it's do you have a man crush I, on these two guys? I think guys? I kind of do. I think you do. I think it's I do. okay. Yeah, it's all right. I just have it's to okay. be comfortable with that. That's all right. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would <laughs> go out on a man date with them. Yeah, go see a movie, nice <laughs> glass of red wine or something. Right. See what happens. But anyway, um, so... Right next to each other on the stage mm. is... I mean, like, right next, right next to each other. <laughs> I think they did it on purpose. They had Dennis Tarnow and David Cochran. And these guys could not be on different planets, any further planets away from each other. I mean, on literally as close to you as yeah, I am right they're now. They're hanging right here, <laughs> and there was, like, fire right there. But so, so the question is asked by Michael Norton right. to David Cochran. He says, you know... You're an ITI guy, which means you know, Stroman implants, and for years you were tissue level implant companies, what Stroman right. was. That, which, of course, for those of you who don't know what that means, mm. tissue level implant for years, and still around, of course, mm -hmm. it was a, a rough and surface all the way up to the top uh, three millimeters, about two point eight millimeters, mm -hmm. had a machined collar. The machined collar was designed to be placed in the sulcus. Mm. So you knew that your micro gap or your place where your abutment and your implant met was going to be away from the bone. Mm. And essentially you knew that there would not be any Who bone. cares about micro gap at this point, right. John? I because, mean, who cares about abutment connection? Right, you're up above the bone. When so was back, this implant invented, by the way? Oh man, this is like way back, man. So were 80s. machined parts really good then? Machine parts in general, yeah. well, not as good as they are today. Right, but but so the, there was there was micro movement yeah. to a big. Some of the connections were problematic. Were yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so the Strauman implant. I mean, we cannot say enough good things. Oh my goodness. About the Strauman implant, Love it, it it's proven, and and the thing you can say is without a doubt, probably the best. Well, not probably the best biologic response of any implant. It's amazing. Is an implant where the micro gap is above the bone, not close to the bone. Yeah. So these days, though, Strauman has gone to a bone level implant. Well, they've developed what? a bone level implant. You think more because of the market or do you the think market, market? I think. I think. I think because the believers behind Strauman really they still believe that this is the implant. Yeah, so well, so cuz David Cochran. Maybe. Right. Well, so so you know Norton asks <laughs> Dave Cochran, he says <laughs> the so tough question, He goes, right? "Well, since Strauman's gone to a bone level implant, he said, how has that been for you going to a bone level implant cuz that's a big change." And Cochran says, "I haven't changed to a bone level implant at all." I'm still using the tissue level. <laughs> and, and the I don't audience think, goes, what? And I don't think Norton was expecting him to say that. Well, I think Dennis knew. No, that Dennis he, knew. Dennis, Dennis knew. knew that he hadn't switched. So so Strauman developed a couple of years ago, they they developed a standard plus, which is essentially, it's a it's a, a tissue level implant with a smaller machined collar. Right, and so it, it took it down to basically 1.8. 1. 1. 8 8 from 2.8. So, right. so why did they do that? So Cochran says, well, here's what we do. Yeah, let's try to cut to the chase here. 
He says, so here's what I do when I put an immediate implant. And he's like, the number one thing is I'm not putting the micro gap below or at the crest of bone. I'm going to leave the micro gap above the bone. So what does he do? He slightly submerges the implant. But so where the rough surface on the buckle is plate all is all below, below the, the buckle bone, plate. But the, but the machine collar is above. And then what he does is he recontours the bone, purposefully removes and scallops the inner proximal what? bone. Come on now. To try, when I heard this, I'm thinking, yeah, are you serious? To get it away from, to try to essentially control where the bone is going to be. So as he's saying this, you could see Dennis getting like physically, like he's squirming, like he's just ready but I, But honestly, to wait a minute. I want to back up for a minute. Yeah. I think that David Cochran is still doing a lot of, you know, single stage implants, even on his For immune. sure. And, and I think that he's a big graft guy. Definitely. He likes to lay flaps. Definitely. He likes a lot of graft material. He likes to over-engineer yeah. his delayed, case. A lot of delayed placement stuff. A lot of stuff. delayed yeah. placement stuff. Yeah. And he does get great results. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're not saying the results right. aren't good. But in, if to everything's... get to yeah. that yeah. result, see here to 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 kind of, you got to understand the backlog here is that Strawman, and you and I have talked about this, has never been a company that wanted to just jump on the wave of what's going on on the forefront. Right. So they, they you know, tissue level work, so why change? Right. Do you remember the, the, the conference we were in where they came out with their tapered implant? Oh, yeah. And we big. were like, well, tapered implants have been around forever, and they're acting like it's a big deal. Right. And it is a big deal, but guess what? I really don't think that... They're a company that wants to be aggressive. And right. because they have people like David Cochran, who really does a good job. Sure. But the market is not wanting this kind of thing because you know why? It's really hard. Yeah, and that's where so Ole Jensen comes in really with hard. this and just says, you know, they had used tissue level for years mm. in every possible position in the mouth. And he said, he, his words were, we couldn't perform restoratively. Because what happens is if you do this, this putting the implant pretty high up, you have very little chance to develop anything with your restorative. Like if it's not perfect, There's no emerging you're profile. sunk. And if you do have facial tissue loss, you're going to see gray. If you do have any change in the bone that's not expected, there's your implant head right there. Whereas Tarnow's whole approach and most, most other hmm. bone level implant people have an approach of, we're comfortable placing the implant subcrestal or at least mm. at the crest because we will our connections are better one than connections they were. are better mm -hmm. and they're willing to accept that there could be some inflammation for the exchange of saying we can develop an emergence profile that right. we can control some people call this word running room right you know, they call it restorative running room you right know, when you talk to brad the dental lab guy he says how much vertical do we have that's another right. thing like do we have enough prosthetic running room to create proper prosthetic contours yep. and a lot of restorations when strawman came out with this tissue level implant they were high water Right. You know, they were basically, hey, you could stick your tongue underneath it yep. because people were getting teeth that never had teeth. Right. And so now people want implants yep. that look like teeth. And and to think, too, about what this does <clears throat> if you're trying to screw retain, oh because you know the problems that happen if you don't have enough vertical and you're trying to make a screw retain restoration, now you run into the problem of, you know, bulky lingles on crowns. You don't even have room for your Teflon. Right, exactly. Your your composites are falling I mean, out of the back. who wants to feel on, you know, one of the things I think that is the biggest complaint from anterior implants that I've restored over the years is that, doctor, it just doesn't... I can feel it with my tongue. I feel it with my tongue. Like, yeah. I can feel... What is it I'm feeling with my tongue? And it's right. like a little bump or a little hoof in the yep. cingulum. Yep. In the cingulum right there. And you know bulky. what that is? Even with the best-placed implant sometimes you're going to have a little bit of that. Yeah. And, yeah. and you better let your patients know. Yeah. And you, guess what? You better be using an implant that has enough room right. to be able to give you enough, basically, room for composite, room for titanium. You better understand, like, the different prosthetic options. Yeah. Because you've seen pictures of some of those lower laterals that I've done where we've done some finagling. Yeah. And it's still bulky. Right. It's still bulky. So I think that the conclusion that I think I took from this was, I am not at all saying that David Cochran's approach is a wrong approach. Like his, his from a biologic standpoint, 
no question, no question that he is going to have less chance of periamplantitis. He's going to have a very nice biologic response. I want to go down another route when you just said that. Word. Right, but I we're know. not going to go there. Well, yet. well, that's right. That's the next topic. Yeah, but but I think that that our our thought on why we believe in bone level subcrustal placement is because aesthetics are our demand. So you're in our not opinion. using polished collars anymore. No polished collars because now, I think aesthetics demand that we that we have control let's over. Stop these things. for just a minute yeah. and let's talk real world stuff yeah. here for a minute because let's say that right now that you know, my number 19 goes south, mm -hmm. okay? And and we go to your office. What would you put in my mouth right now for number 19? For number 19 yes. or number 9? Number 19. Okay. I'm saying 19, not 9. What? So 19, I would feel 100% comfortable with either approach, okay? Mm -hmm. Tissue level's awesome, you know, or bone level subcrustal placement. Because to me, in number 19, I can either control my biology through having like a high water kind of connection mm -hmm. and maybe maybe I'll compromise a little bit of the restorative contour mm -hmm. you know maybe mm -hmm. I'll have a little bit more of an apple on a stick immediate you know? extraction media placement yeah I'm fine with that okay and but a bone level approach would probably allow me to have a little bit more better anatomy a little bit more subgingival anatomy that I can start to so your tongue's not going to feel it like you're talking about right now for number nine though yeah let's talk about number nine yeah uh, for, mine or your wife gets mm -hmm. hit in the face they knock out a tooth. It's non-restorable. What right. are we doing? So for me, it's bone level implant. I'm bone level too. All day long. Bone level as well. Because I I know the restorative uh, uh, control that I have with right. that. And I don't feel that maybe I'm not good enough to contour the bone around a tissue level implant, you know? But I know that I know that I know that I, I've seen great results with bone level implants even now you know, 10 years out yeah. that I feel really good about. I mean, isn't that, is that how you feel too? I feel like that's the case. I feel like that I've been placing enough bone level implants because um, back in the day, you know, I started placing um, um, implants immediately in 2003 mm. at the bone level. And my first cases that I'm tracking in 04 that were placed at bone level, I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, this is pretty amazing. Yeah. Do I have some horizontal... Uh, loss, yes, half a millimeter, but it's undetectable by the untrained eye. And we're not seeing a ton of like periimplantitis I'm because not that's seeing, the big thing that, I'm the, not seeing. that these tissue level guys will say. Right. Is they'll say, well, we're preventing periimplantitis. And right. I say, well, I mean, I, I'm not seeing a ton of that. I'm not seeing patients coming in with, you know, half the bone is gone on their implant. But or, wasn't there a lecture we heard just a minute ago that said that the incidence of periimplantitis at nine years was like 15%. Like 15%. Yeah, Dirk's paper from Sweden, they they were were over there or maybe it's Norway. They can they get, you know, people come back because of socialized medicine so right. they actually come in to see the dentist and and they they published this paper which is I think messing with a lot of people yeah. which showed 15% not just periimplantitis but it was moderate to severe which they defined as I think 2 millimeters right. of bone loss or more and and Everybody's kind of up in arms in this because they're going well fifteen percent. Cochran's loving that because yeah. he's doing these you know right. tissue level implants. Because he feels like he's protecting. He's protecting that. himself, and and Dennis totally disagrees with him on yeah. the stage. Yeah, like and 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 Ole, oh yeah, Jensen basically says or no, was it Tarnow said that he's practicing you know, behind the times. Right. He, Tarnow yeah. actually said... Yeah, well, it was Jensen. He said, yeah, we're Jensen. not going okay, back yeah. to that. We're not, we're not going back, going to back that. because that's where he said we couldn't perform restoratively. Again, I see that. I see that, and I'm kind of there. Yeah. You know, I'm there in the anterior for sure, and in the posterior, I'm still doing bone level implants. Sure. I don't have to. Yeah, but tissue level's fine. Tissue level's fine. But I'm there, and I'm seeing the results, and I'm liking it. Yeah, you know? I don't see any reason to change, but I think that that brings on kind of the final talk <laughs> that they had because it's wow. a perfect segue. Yeah, I, I feel like that Al Berkinson, you know, he, he's, you and I, when we met, we saw him, for the, mm -hmm. I saw him for the first time at in uh, Gothenburg. Right. And, and that's when he started talking about this foreign body reaction. Right. Like, and how far can we actually, you know, overload or load bone, not overload, but how far can we load bone to stimulate growth? Mm -hmm. And he didn't really say foreign body reaction, no. but you saw it then, yeah. you know? And he's and, asking the question of, well, you is, know, it, is there a disease around dental implants, John? Right. Because Tarnow thinks that there's disease right, around dental implants. Tarnow's and then you got, what's his name with the perio probe down here mm -hmm. saying, 
why are we probing Steve implants? Peril, yeah, yeah. Do you probe your implants? And, you know, and I and that was an interesting, it's a great show, discussion. show title. Yeah, it's a great discussion because <laughs> yeah. he he talked about how you know he's like, what's the justification for probing implants? But but I think that this was such an interesting disagreement because you know uh, you listen to Albertson and he's saying that he thinks that the initiation, at least, of peri-implantitis, whatever that means, right, <laughs> is caused by... Well, uh, he named off, like, three ...host things. response, inflammatory reaction that is not something... Immune, immune response. Immune response. Right. Host response. Whereas... Which we know from perio. I remember there's some studies done at uh, West Virginia University regarding periostat. Mm -hmm. Now, this has to do with teeth. Yeah. But basically, low-dose doxycycline mm -hmm. was given to patients, and what they did at WVU to show is that there was no resistance created by giving a patient a low-dose doxy yeah. over a period of a year. Right. Okay, so basically, to slow down what? Right. Right. To slow Turning down the off body's matrix metalloproteins. Yeah, MMPs, baby. baby. Yeah. MMPs. Yeah. You know me. Yeah. That's right. right. Down with MMPs. Right. So whenever what what Al Berkinson is saying is he's saying that there's a host response. Right. And it's a balancing act. Right. There's he said there is no such thing as mucositis. Right. He said there's no disease called mucositis. There's no no disease and, called and whereas Tarnow <laughs> and a lot of other periodontists feel that it's more, you know cement is is the cause of right. much of the beginning of these phase and that bacteria then become the primary problem you know albertson's thought is you know this is more of a foreign body reaction mm. that's the body's immune system is responding by creating inflammation mm. uh and that that is the beginning of this but he did say bacteria could be getting involved yes he didn't disregard bacteria but then you got um james cochran down here or, yeah, yeah, David, David, David Cochran. Cochran. Yeah, I get him all yeah. mixed up. You yeah. know, just Cochran, just call yeah, him Cochran. Cochran. Just call him Cochran. Cochran. He was like, dude, there's 500. There's 500 types of bacteria in the mouth. Right. It's of course, an, there's bacteria. Of course, in there's there. bacteria in there. <laughs> and he was, and and to go to his point, he was like, that's why I put the tissue or right. the bone. I'm tissue, not going to have that. Problem. I'm not going to have that problem. Yeah. And Tarnow's like, whatever, dude. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, I, but I think that that was that that really still. Tell, and they said, uh, you know, clearly they said, you know, we got to have some people really working on this because, mm. you know, this whole idea is like, is titanium a foreign body? Right. Is there an allergic response to titanium? Mm. What do we really know, you mm -hmm. know, about about that? And and I think that that was, uh, you know, th th this whole idea of what is what is really going on with periimplantitis. Mm -hmm. I mean, that this told me that we just don't really know. And they also said an interesting thing about how do we even define, you know, what periimplantitis is, because if you look at it, like I remember Albertson last, last AO, we were in his lecture and he showed a picture of an implant with 50% bone loss. And he said, so what would you do with this implant? Right. He's like, most of you would take it out and replace it. And he said, well, what if I showed you this x-ray that was a follow-up looks the same. He's like, this is 30 years later. It looks right. the same. So basically he's like, something so, happened right. and then it stopped. So he, they're trying to say, you know, what we need to have is a definition of the time, the, the, the rate of progression so like, is for really instance, to, telling. To his point, I see it totally. We talk about early failure, late failure, and I think that the survivability of the implant should start to be looking at, okay, so if this happens within the first three months, mm -hmm. then, and you start to lose crestal bone, right? we've got a problem. Right. And it used to be said, John, if we lose one millimeter of bone in the first year, that's acceptable. Right. Not anymore. So now we need to come back and redefine, and they challenged the, the audience. Yeah, the they, research community. The research community. And... Basically, please define for us how to evaluate implant right. health. Like what's an acceptable rate of change of the bone? Is it really okay if it's 0.2 millimeters per mm -hmm. year? Is that normal or is that a disease process? And at what point do you, how do you define this? Because you can't just look at a radiograph right. and say 50% bone loss, this implant's in trouble because it might've looked like that for 30 years. Can you, can you see why we like this meeting you know, <laughs> I mean, because this is we didn't only... even pre-plan this thing, and like, dude, yeah. I am geek. I know, fest. Because every every time, every year, they bring it, right? And and you know, we we really, I think one of the things we'll do is we're kind of closing the show out. Yeah, is we just want to encourage our listeners to to go to go to meetings, okay? <laughs> like this go. is this is like we feel like we're not like the old guys here. You know, we feel like it sometimes because mm. a lot of younger dentists are not going to meetings anymore, and you hear it from companies and exhibitors things 
you know, they're not coming out anymore. Or the meetings are dying. Right. And, and, you know, I understand part of it is because there's a lot of good stuff online and right. there's good stuff. But there's also a lot of crap online and a lot of stuff that's just, you know, not you're not learning anything from. Well, and, I think one of the lectures showed basically several journals versus right. non-peer-reviewed journals. Right. And right. he compared that to the non-peer-reviewed journals to People Magazine. Right. Yeah. So we, we want you guys to understand that, you know, we know... Because I hear the same discussion so often. I was just back at my my alma mater dental school uh, a few months ago, and I was talking to the head of Pross there, and, and they're just talking about the fact that you know these these students they don't have at least this was the one of the people there. I'm not even gonna say who it was because <laughs> I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But they said this is the students won't tolerate lectures. Like they used what? to, like they have to give them more breaks. They have to give them more group time because they want like immediate, like, give me, just give me the answer. Like, just tell me what just to do. And I, I don't really want to even like, just John, do I need to use, yeah. do I need a penguin? Just do I need, do I need an Austell? Just tell me what to do. Just, just tell me what to do. Tell me how to do it yeah. and just let me do it. Because, but what we're trying to say is that yeah, we're happy and. But is that a doctor? Right. That's why, like, we're happy to try to be those people for you if that's what you want is to try to break it down, you know, because that's what we're here for in one way is we get that. But we also want to encourage you, as we always say, yeah, learn to take more. your learning to the next level and to become part of the thinking process here instead of just looking for what can I do on Monday, which is great. But if you want to take it to the next level, go into these lectures and you just have to sit there and you have to think and you have to be challenged. And then you have to go out to dinner, have a drink, sit and go, OK, what does this mean for me? Like, how did he get to this conclusion? And, and you know, people sometimes ask us, well, how do you guys know all this stuff? We're like, because we because that's the thing. It's deep work. It is. As deep people work. say, you know, yeah. you got to sit down and you got to really think and talk about this. So go to some meetings and don't just go to just your local meeting. But we would encourage you, find a high-level meeting. Mm -hmm. If you're into implants, if you're into occlusion, if you're into, you know, whatever, find find people that are Find passionate. those people that are doing the research, yeah. that are doing it right, yeah. that it's peer-reviewed. And follow them. And follow them. Become and a fan. Become, become a fan. Become a fanboy yeah. of dentistry, right? Yeah. So, hey, I want to plug the next meeting because guess what? We'll be there. Oh, yeah. March 13th through the 16th. Academy and, of Osseo Integration. Yeah, Academy of Osseo Integration. It's osseo.org. Um, again, not a sponsor of the show, um, but yep. March 13th through the 16th in 2019, they'll be in Washington, D.C. They're coming to the East Coast. John and I'll be there covering the annual meeting, uh, uh, the dental guys live from Washington, D.C. And uh, just to kind of give you some uh, rundown, we just mm. received some of the courses that they're going to be putting on. Yep. And John... Um, amazing. So talk about, let's talk a little bit about this is an orthopedics, basically what we've learned in orthopedics about osseo integration. And that's, that's awesome yeah, because they're you know on where, the forefront. Yeah. Because where did Brandomark start and actually where did he end? Right. He ended and started with orthopedics. Yeah, he wasn't a dentist. He wasn't a dentist. Yeah. He wasn't a dentist. And what about this? Um, how valid is literature in implant dentistry? Right. Now, we talked about this a little bit th today, yep. is that there was a couple of times where we heard and call out bad literature. Yep. Basically, very biased stuff. Right. And so I think that, I mean, that's yeah. just a that's taste. That's just a couple that's of just things. A couple little things. There, there's going to be talks about occlusion and oh, what really yeah. matters with biomechanics, or do we just ignore all of that now? Right. right. And there's a whole segment called 10 Years After where they're going <laughs> to talk about, you know, 10 year approach to. That's where you to, turn your head, right? Yeah. And, and so yeah. we just want you to consider a meeting like this or consider a, another high level implant meeting or another high level prosthetics meeting, mm. whatever you want to choose. Consider putting time and money into this. I promise you it will not be a waste, and you will come away maybe even starting to develop your own kind of like people you follow that, that you follow around when they're talking because you realize it's making a big difference in your day-to-day -day dentistry because right. it has for us. It has. It's time. changed our practice. So, so. I, I just want to say, hey, thanks for listening today. If you're 
not on Facebook and you're on Twitter, you need to follow the dental guys over at, at the dental guys. But if you're on Facebook, you may have tuned into the live stream earlier when we released the initial thoughts on some things. But hey, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We're also on YouTube. We release these by video and audio podcast. The audio podcast is on your podcast catcher app, whatever that means, Apple podcast yeah. as they call it. Man. Yeah. Stitcher. And, and guess what, John? We're on Spotify. Yeah, Spotify. Spotify. Man. Yeah, you can dial and I'm, us up. I'm a huge fan of Spotify. Tell your, uh, you can even tell your smart device now to play the dental guys. Really? Yes, you can. I really? tried it the other day. That's pretty sweet. That's I'm gonna try that cool. on the way yeah. home. That's so you can pretty say, sweet. Alexa, play the dental right. guys podcast if hey. you have a Spotify app. Listen, we're gonna keep bringing great content to you. We really uh, appreciate the Academy for putting on this meeting, and I want you guys to continue doing that. Hey, for Wes, or actually for John, the dental guy. I'm Wes, the dental guy. Signing out.